last in our series of uh, NIAC fellows who didn't make it to Tucson is uh, uh, Chris Morrison. I actually saw Chris's talk uh, at the uh, NIAC Symposium online. Uh, I saw a version of this earlier this week, and it's awesome. So uh, Chris, take it away. Thanks. Thanks. Extrasolar objects are obviously objects from outside the solar system, but the good news is, is that they're not very far away. Uh, they fall into the solar system very close to the sun. So it's not a problem of distance. It's a problem of speed. And in general, uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about won't be relativistic. It'll be more like uh, 100 kilometers per second, which is obviously a great improvement on uh, state of the art when you talk about things like Voyager leaving the solar system at you know 17 kilometers per second at delta V. Uh, we're talking about objects that are leaving the solar system at closer to 30 or 40 or maybe 50 kilometers per second at delta V. And the first one of these objects we found in 2017, Oumuamua, uh, brought on a lot of speculation about aliens, because if you were an alien species and you wanted to come visit star systems, it would actually be a pretty good orbit to come very close in and check it out. A few years later, though, we found Borislav, and now we, we tend to think that we're going to find a bunch of these all over the place. So this is a paradigm shift in delta V missions. A lot of times we talk about things like the solar gravitational lens, or we talk about visiting Kuiper or Oort cloud objects. But this is, this is a different dynamic in that it's a delta V problem, not a distance problem. Next slide. So with that, uh, you know, the technology I'm going to talk to you about isn't incredibly, you know, novel in that NASA looked at a lot of radioisotopes back in the 60s. They had polonium and cesium and strontium. Russians launched a lot of strontium. Uh, we've, over the last many, many years, have gotten used to plutonium-238. And a lot of the selection criteria for these is uh, based on a generic mission architecture of we're going somewhere far in the outer solar system and we need about you know 50 to 100 years of power. Uh, but that's not the case with these types of objects. Uh, if you are able to spot them um, and look at their trajectory, uh, then you know even if they're leaving the solar system or even if you catch them at a bad time, if you have you know, you, you can complete a mission in something like 10 years, 15 years. And there's actually been a lot of work done. Uh, Project Lyra has done a ton of orbital mechanics looking at, hey, if we had, you know, X kilometers per second at Delta V at this date, how, how fast could we catch up to these objects? So uh, the general consensus was for that project, looking mostly at chemical systems, was 35 kilometers per second at Delta V leaving in 2027 could get you a flyby in something like 15 to 20 years. Uh, so, you know, 35 kilometers per second is, is a flyby, but I'm talking about uh, something that, you know, there are a lot of great sail concepts out there. I love the NIAC sail concepts, but something that we can do that's unique with radioisotopes is that we can slow down when we get there. Uh, we don't need uh, solar energy. We can basically, uh, you know, leave Earth at a high, you know, do a gravity slingshot around Jupiter, most likely, get into the plane of the object, intercept it, and actually slow down and check it out, and then come back to Earth. And uh, that's the type of mission architecture that's enabled by really this idea that, hey, forget plutonium, save plutonium for Pluto. And let's look at shorter lived isotopes and specifically cobalt 60. Next slide. So we actually have been working on a technology that is a generic isotope production technology at my company, USNC Tech. This is something that you start out, you manufacture it in a lab with the proper precursor. You encapsulate it before you irradiate it later. So you have this uh, dual ceramic architecture. Then you put it in the, the neutron reactor, and those neutrons interact with the precursor material, the ooey gooey center, and they convert it into the radioisotope of choice. And you know, some people say, oh, you know, you aren't getting 100% conversion. Well, we don't need 100% conversion. With something like cobalt 60, the power density, because it has a short half life, is uh, about 17 uh, grams per watt, ideally. And if we even got four grams, uh, or, you know, or sorry, yeah, 17 watts per gram. And if we even got four watts per gram or three watts per gram, uh, it's actually fairly revolutionary. So the goal is not to get 100% cobalt 60. It's to have an easy, producible architecture that you can produce a lot of these for. And 
we're developing this mainly looking at another isotope called thulium-170, uh, which is not useful for this mission, but it's useful for missions to the moon. Uh, thulium-170 has a higher power density than, for example, plutonium-238, um, but it has a very short half-life, 129 days. So next slide. So this is kind of the, the near-term architecture, and we're actually looking at flying these uh, you know, demonstration units uh, in the near future, and then watt scale units and scaling that to kilowatts. There are some supply chain challenges with producing radioisotopes. Uh, but for reference, the medical industry produces about 100 kilowatts of cobalt 60 every year. And, you know, that's uh, far below what you could do if you had a concerted effort um, actually, cobalt-60 is starting to fall out of favor in the medical industry in favor of a lot of proton treatment. So uh, there's you know, potential for uh, us to continue so looking at something like cobalt-60 or other isotopes or other production methods. Next slide. So let me put this in context. You're never going to use a radioisotope for a large human mission. It's a lot of radioisotope. But this is really enabling because you can cut it into smaller pieces and you can look at small sats, um, things uh, metric ton and under, and enable them to achieve the specific mass uh, levels that, that nuclear electric propulsion, traditional fission nuclear electric propulsion can achieve. But the problem with, with NEP is that you need a very large vehicle to even start, you know, kind of megawatt scale vehicles to start looking attractive on the specific mass levels. Another benefit of this is that you don't get any neutrons. So it's, it's very nice with things like uh, thermionics, where the Russians and the Topaz system actually put up thermionic fission reactors, but they had problems with neutron swelling. Um, but a lot of those materials don't have the same problems. Uh, solid state material for power conversion uh, has significantly less challenges with x-rays than they do with neutrons. So there's, there's some interesting things uh, when you compare these. Next slide. So this is the concept we came up with for the NIAC program, uh, a roughly 100 kilowatt thermal cobalt-60 uh, system. And there's a lot of assumptions built into here, but the basic idea is this is solid state power conversion. Didn't want to go too crazy. You know, in, in NIAC, you ask for one miracle, not two. So the power conversion actually uses TRL-5 uh, JPL um, thermoelectrics that uh, they've been working on. There's segmented high temperature thermoelectrics that could, you know, if, if, if I took it at face value, you know, can get you even 12, maybe even 14% efficiency. Um, another benefit of the cabs is that you can get to the high temperatures. There's no moderator. There's no nothing that's temperature sensitive. It's a dumb hot rock, right? It, it's something that produces heat um, and you can compare it with, you know, you don't need a control system, you don't need control rods, you just need to pair it with perhaps a solid state power conversion system that is preferably X-ray tolerant, uh, because there are a lot of X-rays coming out of many of these. So th this is the fundamental concept, and really the thing that, that's, that has to be figured out um, is, in my opinion, the production of the radioisotope. And that's uh, where a lot of the focus of the study was on. But we also looked at a lot of the uh, power conversion architectures trying to drive towards that five kilograms per kilowatt. Next slide. So another key innovation here is uh, regulatory. That up until about two years ago, it was there was nothing that allowed commercial companies to put things into space that were nuclear, at least you know radioisotope or fission. But there was recently a memo released, and uh, this uh, memo directed the FAA to be the regulator. And uh, there's at a tier two level, you end up with an insert somewhat similar to the old process. But the idea is that commercial companies can do this. And this is something that, you know, nobody, when I submitted this to NIAC, when, uh, you know, the thing was, is, hey, this is, you know, what we want you to prove us. Uh, prove that you're right on is the regulatory part. Are you going to be allowed to launch this? Not, you know, it's not so much that there's some new physics here. It's that there are regulatory and, and some power conversion challenges that prevent this from, in many people's eyes, being a, a good technology, or not so much a good technology, but a something that someone can actually use for a mission and not have to spend billions of dollars for launch approval. 
so you know this is this is a very in-depth topic but we are actually looking at launching uh tier one radioisotope systems with our lunar systems uh, for this particular mission it would be a tier two but a unique thing that you find with a lot of this is that a the, the difference between plutonium and cobalt in terms of what falls under the lower category of, of radioisotope is that you can have about 16 kilowatts of cobalt-60 before you run into problems. Whereas plutonium-238, you have 90 watts of power before you run into a tier two system. So from a regulatory standpoint, um, a lot of these gamma emitters and beta emitters are much less penalized because generally it's a it's an inhalation or a or a you know gets in the groundwater type of dose thing, whereas cobalt sixty is not nearly as bad as plutonium in those types of situations. So, um, anyways, there's a lot I could go into here. I don't think a lot of the people in the audience uh, and there's a lot of nuances to this that I could talk about for hours. Next slide. So. Based on the knowledge that, hey, uh, if you have, you know, the limitation here is production of radioisotope in many ways, uh, the cost to produce it, the reactors you need to put it in, it's a supply chain challenge. So what, what could you do with less radioisotope um, over kind of a 10 year mission? And the idea is that, you know, okay, what's your payload mass? So on the, on the y-axis here, we see various payload masses. On the x-axis, we see various ISPs and, you know, if you have, instead of 100 kilowatts, you go down to 10 for the same 20 kilogram payload, which we baselined, uh, we're talking somewhere in the realm of, of still like 85 kilometers per second of Delta V. Um, and that's a lot. So, you know, imagine 10 of these, instead of just having one, you could have 10 of them. And another key thing about this is we have to wait for these interstellar objects to fall into our solar system. So what if two fall in at the same time or, uh, you know, the, the idea is that the more, more um, spacecraft that we can have on demand, perhaps the more effective the architecture, especially as we start getting some of these facilities, such as I believe the LSSW, I'm forgetting the, what it stands for, but it's supposed to detect many of these objects, um, as many as perhaps one or two a year uh, when that's running. Um, and then even going down to one kilowatt of thermal power, that could enable a flyby of Oumuamua, you know, in, in reality, if, if we can get, you know, assuming a flyby is a little bit less payload mass, maybe five kilograms, um, you could still get 50 kilogram or 50 to 60 kilometers per second of Delta V out of those types of systems. Um, and that would be more than enough that if it launched within the 2020s, it could return flyby data for Oumuamua in about 10 to 15 years. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility you can get on these extrasolar objects, um, and this technology is is interesting. It's not a, a catch-all. It's not a cure-all. It's not something that that we're going to necessarily use for the gravitational lens, or or going out to do anything interstellar. But it is it represents a step change in the kind of chemical and uh, architectures that that we see today towards 100 kilometers per second of delta V. Next slide. So um, with that, I'd love to talk more to people. Um, the idea here is that this is a commercial product. Uh, the NIAC represents the kind of future potential and the near term is kind of more of looking at uh, RHUs that are commercial. Um, and you know, if anyone's interested in this type of thing and for the interstellar crowds, there actually is one isotope here that, that we are looking at that has about a thousand year half-life. It's not very power dense, but the idea might be you put it on your your probe and it might give you a few watts of power when you're at Alpha Centauri or something like that. So if anyone's if anyone's interested, um, I'd love to chat more. All right. Um, so we do have a question. Um, could you land on some of the near Earth objects and hitch a ride into space? It it looked as if your um, intercept missions probably allowed for something of that nature, but could you expound upon that a little bit more? Yeah, so the idea is that we, the CONOPS of the mission is that we uh, have a telescope that detects a near Earth object. It might be inbound, it might be outbound, um, but the standard architecture is we launch, or maybe we have something waiting in a high orbit, maybe a Lagrange point, and it, executes a plane change maneuver around Jupiter. So it flies out to Jupiter, does a plane change. Um, there might be other planets, depends on the alignment of the planets and various things like that. But um, 
and then it flies out and it, it as it's flying out it's accelerating halfway to the object and then it's decelerating the other halfway to the object it, it's very when it, when you deal with these high you know when you when del, deal with delta v's that are well above escape velocity tip it's kind of like kinematic equations you know you accelerate halfway you decelerate the other halfway and you um end up you know basically rendezvousing with these objects and um there, you know, while you're there, you could totally hang out and, you know, if it has a strong enough gravitational field, orbit it um, and check it out. But the the payload that we notionally put on it was a Hayabusa 2-like sample return mission, the one where they shot, you fly up close to the object, you shoot a bullet into it, and then you capture a few grams of sample. Now, would that work on an object that might be like solid nitrogen or something like that? I don't know. It's kind of like a notional, I, I don't know what a sample return type payload would look like, but if you if you carried a secondary payload, you could totally leave maybe a, a, a flyer or, or even a rover or, or something on the object as it travels out. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea was that you bring back uh, a sample from that object and you would look at things like isotopic analysis and um, various things like that. And uh, another possible conops is if you're flying up to it, make sure it's not an alien object because you're a very, uh, at least the front of the spacecraft is very radioactive. So if it, <laughs> stay away, you know, try to communicate at a distance if it's an alien spacecraft. I'd like to try to make sure that I understand this a little bit correctly. Would you be able to tune your specific impulse by selecting the different types of radio isotopes? And like for shorter, higher impulse missions, you would select a, a radio isotope with a short half-life and a you know pretty rapid decay? Absolutely. Yeah, that's the idea behind it is that all radio isotopes have, they're different, but they have about the same amount of energy in them. Uh, their half-life determines how fast that energy is is um, emitted. So if you pick a short half-life material, it, it's like a boost of energy in the beginning. A longer half-life of ma material, it, it's kind of spread out over a longer time. And I will say once you get beyond maybe about 30 years, plutonium is looking pretty darn good. It's pretty hard to beat, but we do have a lot of good ones that are, you know, think of maybe 30 years or less that could potentially be very useful. Um, there's the caveats of, hey, we're putting out a lot of x-rays. How do we deal with these x-rays? You know, distance, possible shielding, um, and things like that. But, you know, yeah, the, for, the, for the lunar missions we're looking at, you know, the 129-day half-life Thuliums uh, technology is perfect because a lot of those people, they want to survive a few lunar nights, but they don't want to support a mission for 10 years type of thing. Are you able to save a little bit of mass by switching instead from the heavy transuranics to something along the lines of a technetium? Yeah, so there's there's only so many isotopes we can make in the process that I described. You know, so there's on the chart of nucleides, you know, uh, I think 1700 nucleides or something like that. Um, the ones we can make, there's there's generally about a dozen of them. Uh, that, that we can make effectively with various half-lives. Uh, so technetium is one that is not something we can make with a fission reactor, but there are interesting accelerator and neutron-based fusion and other things where we could actually make more isotopes um, using a lot of these methods, but the, the fission reactor currently has the highest flux. So what I'll say is the transuranics, they're, they're some of the best materials um, in terms of their, their power per unit mass, um, their decay, they might have like a 5 MeV alpha or something like that, whereas cobalt 60 is about 2.6 MeV. Um, so they're about, they're very similar in terms of energy density, but in terms of power density, because of the perfect half-life of cobalt, the power density of cobalt 60 is about 30 times that of plutonium 238. Thank you. Chris, great job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.